be seated. Take that microphone and move it away so it doesn't look like I'm, yeah, Mexican. Yeah. Our stage crew, give our worship team and our stage crew a big God bless you. And, and I, which I always appreciate our tech people too and our sound people. And it's, it takes a lot of people to put this together and make it not look as confusing. And if there is a problem, if something's not right, it's my fault, not theirs usually. Okay, I'll just make sure. Everybody's clear on that, so. Um, when we do the uh, children in Sanctuary Day, just to be clear, the, uh, our uh, children church directors, they have, they provide a coloring uh, uh, page and some crayons and things that you can get on the way in on days like today, just to, so you'll know, and um, today's that day. Uh, it's usually the same day in the calendar. One of the reasons why we've adjusted is because we're setting up, there's a team out there setting up for the uh, dinner afterwards, so that's why. But I'm glad that my grandson is right in the front row, right? Are you glad you're here? <laughs> he came to me and said, there's no children's church? He started to be sad, and then I, he looked at me, and I said, well, I'm going to, you'll be in here with me, and he said, Papa, can I go in your office? <laughs> that's what he said. Didn't you say that? Did you say that to me? Back it. Oh, he says, he thinks I'm selling them down the river. Well, but you're getting here with me. You're going to stay here with me? You can drink my water if you get thirsty, okay? All right? Okay. Book of James, what a great, we continue in the book of James, and we're in our eighth uh, selection. James, of course, is the half-brother of Jesus, and he is uh, fighting through, uh, having been raised up, he's fighting through the idea that, you know, his brother, in my mind, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of preaching between the, Scriptures, I just think it's logical that he is, uh, you know, it's one thing to believe in Jesus, and thank God if you have, you have, but when he's someone you grew up with, and he's never sinned, that's pressure. I mean, I followed my big brother, I was number two, and he got a congressional appointment to West Point. I did not. You know what I'm saying? So we all have sibling things, you know, so here's Jay. But God, uh, but he puts his faith in Christ, and God um, uh, really uses him, in the earliest uh, book written, to, I believe, build a base of what it is going to be to be part of the family of God. Expectations are there, who you are. And we, we've been journeying through, we, we solve the faith and work question that it's not one or the other, and that, that it, you know, it takes, it's, a, it's a faith to get saved, and it works to reveal that you got saved. And uh, it's declared, you know, we, Jesus confronted Legion, and uh, you know that story well. But also, uh, we're told in scriptures that even the demons believe. So just believing and not letting it change your life, we've been reminded through, through teaching of here this, in this series, it's not enough just to say, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, but you have to allow that belief to transform you, amen? And so uh, we, we're Protestants, we protest against the idea that we can work ourselves into heaven. But we're also New Testament believers who believe that once we're saved, it ought to change the way we choose things and what we say and do. Say amen. James focuses this morning about, about what we say both as a, up front as leaders and also within our private lives. In chapter 3, it says this, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. Nobody's perfect. If anyone does not stumble in word... He's a perfect man. We'll talk about that in a minute. Also to bridle, uh, he's a perfect man. Also to be able to, able also to bridle his whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned to a very small rudder where the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue of a little member has a little member and boasts great things. So how great a force a little fire it kindles 
And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is also set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. It is set on fire by hell. For every beast and bird or reptile and creature of sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly, evil, full of deadly poison. Tell us how you really feel, James, huh? I mean, well, with it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitudes of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brother, these things ought not be to be so. Does a spring send forth both fresh water and bitter water at the same opening? Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt and water fresh. So, you know, we now we walk to our tap and we turn the water on and we expect good water to come out unless we live in three rivers. But anyway, it, <laughs> there's good water to come out. We, tr we trust it. We just drink it, right? You know, but when they, as, as this is being written, they had a search for water. I mean, I've been to the Holy Land. Some of you have been with me there. Gone, so water wasn't natural, so you could get good water and they knew where the good fresh springs were. But there was also bad water that was uh, not, not drinkable, and so he's identifying with this, you know, you don't go one day and it's fresh water and then go back an hour later and be bad water. You, get, you know where the good stuff is. And so the challenge is, and we all, this is for every believer, all of us, is to allow ourselves, first of all, he declares that um, teaching, in other words, is not for everybody. Now remember, now teaching now is tough, especially portable, uh, public school teaching, but teaching, the pressure, we have got some teachers in here that have the gift of teaching, but to stand up in front and present in a way where people aren't bored, they don't turn you off, and they'll come back again next week, there's pressure in that, and it's not for everybody, we should all be teaching within our lane, like if you're a dad, you teach your children, mom, teach your children, so influence, you don't teach, but I'm talking about the upfront teacher, see, it was so revered back in James's time that people wanted to do it who weren't qualified, weren't trained, and weren't very good at it. But they thought, oh, if I could get up in front and say something. So he warns him. He says, by the way, if you, are, if you teach and you're not called to it, you're going to have a stricter judgment. And I will tell you why in a minute. But there's a tougher standard. First Corinthians, Paul writes and says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? In other words, he's saying, find your gift and work in your gift. But if your gift is not teaching... Don't get up and teach. Now, that doesn't mean when we just, if we need somebody to be with the youth, ah, that's not my gift. No, it's talking about the public forum where you get up in front. And by the way, this desk to me is sacred because people stand beyond here and, and they separate the word of truth. It's very powerful what happens from this desk. And so I don't just let anybody get up here. When I, when I bring in a Kirby or an Ed or I use staff, I, you know, I listen when I, or I listen afterwards I, I'm responsible in a weird sort of way. I know it's hard to imagine, but if I let somebody come up here and teach, I'm responsible for what they say. Not initially, but if I allow them to do it without correcting, I'm responsible. And there's a judgment on me, and there's a judgment on Pastor Seth when he teaches, and, even, and uh, you don't have to be a pastor. If I, if I ask you to teach or I allow you, it's a little weird, maybe not to let you, but say, then that means, I, first of all, I trust you, and second of all, you, you are now responsible for what you say when you do it. But if I don't correct you, or if I continue to give you a forum, I'm responsible, and why is that? Because this has influence. This influences people. Also, when preachers don't say what the Bible says, leave out the tough scriptures, don't challenge the dark world that we live in, don't address the culture, there's influence there too. If they're cowardly so they won't take on the, the culture today because they're afraid of losing butts and bucks, yeah, that's right. I said butts. Sorry. I forgot the kids were in here. But if they're afraid that people won't come, because then you know what? They're going to stand before God, the Bible says, and they will be judged and say, you didn't tell the truth. You didn't preach the whole Bible. Maybe you wanted to be popular. Maybe you didn't want to hurt people, your friends, whatever your motive. If you don't teach the truth, the whole word of God, some of you say, yeah, but Pastor, you don't have to do it every sermon. <laughs> no, I don't teach it every sermon. But, you know, then, then you're accountable. And if I bring in a teacher for Wednesday night and they don't say what the Bible, if they don't study diligently and don't present it truthfully, they'll answer to God. So he's saying, don't just want to be a teacher because you think, wow, you get to be up front, you know, and it's easy to do. And I've teased over the years and say that I'm nervous. I'm not really nervous, but I take it so serious when I'm up here. I like to have fun, and, and it no, no, doesn't mean we can't laugh, and I try to poke fun at myself. And, and be, but, but, but the idea that you walk out of here and you haven't, I've misled you in some way, or I was afraid to say what God, wanted, what God wanted me to say, or I looked at the scriptures and knew what it meant, but I glossed over it, so you would like me more, you will be judged, I will be judged 
wanting when I stand before the Lord. I don't know that it would keep me out of heaven, but it would sure get me a trip to the woodshed, if you know what I mean. God's not pleased. And so if you say you want to teach, or if you're called to teach, and you better do it, you better study, you better do it right, you better not take it lightly, you better not care, you better not, uh, you know, uh, when, I, when I teach young people in homiletics, I say, and, and of course I'm known for not the best titles. Pastor Seth told me there's a, someplace I can go, I don't, I don't have it, I don't have the app, but just say, title on James chapter 3, and gives me all these titles, but, um, but there's also the danger of being too clever, being too clever and missing what was trying to be said. Yeah, how many of you know what I'm saying? Or, 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 or itching ears or trying to, trying to be too funny. Like, like this is going to shock you, but I've never come to this pulpit and said, today I'm going to be funny. I've got a funny thing to say here. I've never, never thought that, you know, because I just wait and you give me material once I get up here. That's what I, I don't have to. See what I mean? How you respond. So I don't try to do that. And, and, and you know, it, it's not a goal of mine, and, but, but I'm also, I'm a conversational preacher. I'm not, I'm not Rod Parsley. I'm not Billy Graham. I'm not, you know, uh, 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 I don't, in other words, you be who you are as a teacher, but as you're studying, you don't go, ooh, I better leave that one alone. No, 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 no. no. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. And so this is a strict warning from James because at the time, being the rabbi, being the teacher was whatever, you know, that was the highest goal. So it's okay to have ambition in all areas, but if your ambition is, comes with influence, you're going to be judged differently. If I influence you not to live right because I left something out or I said something to do, if I influence you not to live, for, then you're in trouble because you made the choice, but I'm in trouble because I'm, I'm the rabbi. I'm the teacher. Are we clear? So James is warning you. So this is why, and I don't, I don't parade around like this and coach, and I'm not one of those pastors, but this is why respect for the pastor or the teacher is so important that we don't violate, the, uh, the, and that, that spiritual abuse is not done from this pulpit. There's constant cases of people using this as a bully pulpit to strategize or get their own way, and that's not Bible either. Everything we say will be judged, the Bible says, particularly if you have a, a person of influence. Now, maybe you say, well, Pastor, I'm not much of a person of influence. I bet you'd be surprised. I bet you, and if you have a child in your home, you're influencing them by what you do and say. So that's the challenge. So there's a tougher standard. Because of their influence, they have to limit their stumbling and be careful. You say, well, wait a minute. Hey, Steve, that's just perfect. I know you, Pastor Steve. You're not perfect. How many of you know that to be true? Raise your hand. Vern, put your hand. But that doesn't, that's not the best translation of that word. That's as we translate it. What it means is mature. Or how many of you are glad that you don't have to be perfect before the Lord? But you have to be, it's not about perfection. It's about direction. My direction has to be being maturing. Go, I came here 31 years ago. We were not recording the sermons. I'm very glad. Okay? I know you wrote everything down I said, so you have the notes, but still. My point is, we mature. Our direction should be to mature. So when you see the word perfect or even holy, it doesn't mean that you're perfect. It just means that you're, you're maturing. You're, you're growing. You want that. Your desire is to be that way. So in verse 2, when it says perfect, it means, you know, the, the, that teacher is obviously maturing. So that was, what am I saying? Well, the immature, the young, the new Christians, they need to focus on listening, listening, listening. I said it three times because some of you aren't listening. Yeah, what did he say? Yeah. And learning. You're in the learning mode. If you're a new Christian or you're new in the church or you've been away and you're back, that's the time to sop it up. Learn, learn, learn. And don't be so quick to speak or try to, and, and so that, that's James' challenge. And he says, you know, horses have bits and ships have rudders, but uh, what do we have to help guide us? Well, we have the Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad? In other words, if we let the Holy Spirit, and it the Holy Spirit will give you the boldness to speak, and it will also tell you, I'm going to use a word now, don't use this word, kiddos, but the Holy Spirit has actually told me to shut up, Steve. That seems rude, but I needed to hear it that way. Because you know why? He was saying, be, be quiet, and I wasn't being quiet. Right? Come on now, don't act it. Get, hey, take your pharisaical robe off, and let's literally talk about this. We need the Holy Spirit to kind of check us. That's the, bit, that's the rudder that we have. That's why we need to stay filled with the Holy Spirit. So as we start to talk, you know, unless you have Kathy following you around, you know, you're not going to have that. So you start to talk. But, but, you know, I say that with kind of a, but listen to me, and listen here. God uses Kathy and you and you and you and you, and you if you care about people, to, in a loving way, say, hey, 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 you know, so... 
Don't think, the Holy Spirit is not some mist that floats around. I mean, yes, we could get an impression, but sometimes your dad and mom is the Holy Spirit talking to you through them. Did you know that? Your dad and mom. You say, your mom, when she corrects you, is if she's led by the Lord and following Scripture, that's the Holy Spirit. Men, listen up. Which, by the way, after watching that video, I may never take my shirt off again. Where'd they get those guys? What's that all about? Good grief. No men signed up. Five women signed up for the conference when, after that video. Your wives can be the voice of the Holy Spirit in your life. It happened in Scripture several times. Sometimes they listened, sometimes they didn't. Your spouse, your parents that could say, that, that can be the rudder, that can say, hey, 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 you know, enough of that talk. Let's not talk about that. What does the Bible say about gossip? Where there's much talk, there's sin. So it says, you tone it down. So, you know, how many of you know there's been a time, and how many of us have walked, come out of a meeting or driven home from something and went, oh, man, I wish I wouldn't been part of that. I've done that. Oh, man. You have too? Yeah. You have. Just because they're sitting in the back doesn't mean that they don't need to hear this. Say it louder for the people in the back. We've come out of a meeting and gone, man, I blew that. Well, where'd you get that thought? That came from God. And in the meeting, he was saying, hey, 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 but we weren't listening. So we learn from our, our mistakes. And so that, what we say, so we're not perfect, but what's our direction? I want the Holy Spirit to correct me, convict me, and comfort me once I repent. How about you? I'm open for correction or conviction, correction, and then comfort. Because after I'm corrected, I need some comfort. I'd like to live the rest of my life and never hurt another person by a thing I said. It's unlikely. How about you? But I don't want it to ever be intentional. I believe I've asked God to help me later. I don't want it to be intentional. Verse 6 says that our tongues can set our worlds on fire. Wow. They can destroy reputations, families, friendships, and reputations. I guess I said that twice because I wanted to remind you about reputations. That can be destroyed. Destroyed. Think about that. You know, whoever said sticks and stones... They break my bones. That part's true. But names will never hurt me. That's not true. That's not true. Some of us who had parents that weren't believers and were old school, we've, the spankings don't hurt anymore, but if we allow ourselves, and, and we don't have to, and we shouldn't, but if we allow ourselves to remember the things that our dad or mom may have said to us, that can, that can still be like another rock hitting our heart, can it? Why is that? Now, in, as we get emotionally healthy and spiritually healthy, we get to a place where we don't allow that to happen. But it's funny how those words can kind of continue to echo in our lives, something somebody said out of mean. I'm not talking about, you know, joking around and the Bible says it's okay to jest. It says it's not okay to coarse jest. It speaks to intent and meaning. And if you're not good at reading people, whether or not you're hurting them, stop jesting. Let me say it again. If you're not really good at it, stop jesting. But I'm going to... God wants us to be, you know, robots or sticks in the mud or never laugh, or never have fun. I don't believe that. But I just have to be so careful. And it's better to lean on the side of less than more. President Calvin Coolidge, he was, he was called Silent Cal because he was known for not saying very much. And he said, I've never hurt anybody's feelings by not talking. Think about that. And then it says it's impossible to tame the tongue. So if we stop reading the Bible right there, we're like, oh, man. Thanks a lot, Pastor Steve. I'm going to skip the Mexican fiesta banquet and go home. You just said it's impossible. You said God demands it, and then you said it's impossible. Ah, I said it's impossible for me to do it. But it's not impossible for the Holy Spirit to do it in me. It's difficult to tame our tongue, but it's not impossible with the Lord's help. And I know that from Scripture. And what do we use to interpret and understand Scripture at New Hope? Other scripture. And so what does the Bible say? The psalmist says that no man can tame, I mean, verse 8 of James says no man can tame their tongue without help. If you look at verse 8, it says no man can tame the tongue. It's unruly. However, full of deadly poison, thank you, James, what a joy that is to hear. Bob, but the psalmist, David says, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. So if we'll pray that prayer, if that's our desire, we can have a guard set by the Holy Spirit over our mouth. We don't have to say mean things to our spouses. We don't have to say mean things to our children. You might say, well, pastor, my pa that's in the past. Repent. Fess up. 
fess up. My daughter's here today, and she knows that I've told you this before, but I was, I was far from being a perfect dad. I had a horrible example, not making excuses, but I also had wonderful examples. You know who they were? Church people. I had church people in my life, and I watched how they spent time with their kids. So I can't, my dad was, a, was um, uh, not a good example. But when I blew it, and one thing I never saw as a child, I got with my kids, and I said, Daddy blew that. I, I mishandled that. I, I shouldn't have said that, or I was too hard on you with that. And, you know, most of the time, at least Tiffany would say, it's okay, Daddy. That's, that's what kids say, isn't it? By the way, when I said Tiffany, I didn't mean not Nikki, but I sort of meant not Nikki. But um, uh, she would say, it's okay, Daddy. And I'd say, I'd have to stop. And usually I'd get down because they're so little. And I'd get down and I'd say, no, nope, not okay. I need you to forgive me. And there'd be tears, because they're so quick to forgive when they're kids. I wish we were forgiven when we were adults, don't you? Maybe we need to have faith like little children. That's what Jesus taught. Forgive quicker. How many of you had a, you can raise your hand. How many of you had to ask your kids to forgive you for something you said? Yeah. That is mature. That's humbling ourselves. See, the world says, you'll look weak. But Jesus says, no, you'll be maturing as you do that. And then we pray like the psalmist, Lord, set a guard on my mouth. Keep me from saying things that don't please you. Keep, I love this part. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Wow. Wow. <laughs> who of us, who, how many of you like me need to, need to pray that prayer? Uh, yes, yeah. Help us, Lord. You see, because what we say, what comes out of our mouth, reveals on what's going on inside us. It reveals who we are. Now, to some degree, we can have those days, and I've worked with some of you here, you've been on staff, and you've said some things, that people say, I can't believe, and I always say, I don't judge people by one bad sentence or one bad word. Or one. I take the big picture. Aren't you glad? Yeah. I take the big picture. That doesn't mean if somebody, if you love somebody, gives you permission just to rile off on them, you know, but, but, you know, with spouses, I tell them, they say, my wife, I said, look at the big picture. Try to embrace that. We recognize that, but if you have a habit of saying inappropriate things, um, we heard um, a sermon Thursday, and I'll steal a line from it. It's come from some, uh, another place for helping people. It's called HALT, H-A-L-T. And if somebody is hurting, alone, lonely, I can't remember what the T is. But what I say in my version is, if you're, if you're hurting physically, emotionally, spiritually, and you're tired, you're, you're a recipe for saying the wrong thing. Now, we can't always fix the pain immediately, but we can get back right spiritually. We can, we can spend more time with Jesus and his word. So if you find yourself and judge yourself, because other people are doing it, you might as well saying the wrong thing. I can't believe I said that. Why did I say that? I've had to, why did I say that? And the Holy Spirit says, you haven't spent enough time with Jesus. You haven't been in my word enough. So if you find yourself hearing it, say, oh, man, I didn't read. You know, and if it becomes a pattern, you need to stop. We need to stop. and Because the Holy Spirit, we, we, David prayed, you set a governor on my mouth. You, 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 you set the guard. Well, how does we do that? The Bible. The Bible is our guard. And so if I'm not spending time in the word and I stub my toe, he also said that he doesn't golf. He doesn't golf because he doesn't want to swear. <laughs> That's a, you know. I mean, I go on the golf course. I don't, we, I don't swear on a golf course, but I hear Jesus' name a lot and God a lot out there. You can maybe hear it. A lot of Christians out there. I don't know what's going on. They yell it too. Wow. It's like a praise fest out there. So if you're having a thing where you find yourself saying it to people you love or even inappropriate, then you, it, that's a, that's a, that is a barometer to say, hold it. What's, what's that? Why did I say that? Or if you're an exaggerator, you find yourself lying and exaggerating because you have a poor self-image and you try to influence people with things that aren't true. You know, some people, if you catch three fish, don't worry, they've caught four. They're ready to tell you immediately. How many know what I'm talking about? So what we say reveals who we are. And that's why we, we, want, we want good, good 
good water, fresh water to come out. Matthew says, Jesus is teaching in Matthew 15, and he says, not what goes in the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out. See, the, the, the uh, Pharisees were big on what you could eat, what you couldn't eat. You know, how many of you are glad that you're not back in the How many like a good, a good, nice good fried shrimp? Yeah, well, you know, back then, that was a no-no, you know, like a good crab dinner to you, yeah? Really? Must be doing better than me financially, but, you know, you like that? Well, you can, you know, yeah. It's all about what went in. All these rules, regulations. It got so bad that, that the Bible says the rules were keeping them from make, entering into heaven. And Jesus shows up and, and he teaches and he says, it's not what goes in, it's what comes out. How many of you know that's true in your relationship? Come on now. I say that as we stand on the brink of a Mexican feast. It's not what goes in, it's what comes out. So get on in there, fill your plate. Of your mouth. Okay. Some of you, I want to see you at the altar right after service. Making up their own jokes. I'll be the funny one in here. Don't be making up your own jokes. Can we edit that out? <laughs> no, we can't. Oh, boy. All right. Only at New Hope. But he's saying, you know, you're so worried about what they digested, but they were neglecting the meanness that they could be to people. Mark saw it, said it this way. He said, what comes out of a man that defiles a man. And so what I like to say is I like to keep a short account with me on that because think about it. If I don't keep my governor in check, you guys will be shocked at the pastor. You could, you know, I could stub. So, yeah, I think the Lord allows us to stub our toe to let us see how we're doing. I mean, know what I'm talking about? Because we're not all golfers. And even when I'm out there, I'm not a golfer, but, I, you know. But we allow things to come in our life. But so, so I'm asking you today, you say, well, what do you, what should, if I had to write my sermon in a sentence, Seth and I talk about this, is to be discerning and aware about what you're saying. That's what James is saying. Think about what you're saying. This is, a, this is, it could be a little bit about the jokes you tell, what's funny to you, but how you talk to people and what you say to people. Oh, it's no big deal. She knows I love her. It's a big deal. Not because she, she yes, your wife should forgive you or your, that, that's that side. That, we could preach on forgiveness. It's about if that's coming out of you, what's going on inside you? What's missing inside your Christ-like character that could get you to say something like that and say, oh, well, she knows I care about her. No. No, the Holy Spirit is there to get to because we want to be changed. And the problem is, you're going to see, we're missing the opportunity to bless. If we're cursing, we're not blessing. Pastor Joe and I have been together for 20 years. You know, a lot of conversation, a lot of teasing. And I'm very I've been hurt a lot of times, but I've healed up from it and I forgive him. Aren't you glad? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I just pause here and say, I'm not talking about being so robotic and cold and being so afraid to relax around people. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about reading people, but even more than that, letting the Holy Spirit read me and recognize that if there's a, a, a smidge of a wince, that we need to check it. I've said this for 30 years. I'm saying, let's keep short accounts about what we're talking about. Not just what we say to people, but about them. Keep short accounts. Be careful. You can destroy a man's character. And you can say, well, somebody told me. And by the way, this is, if you want to see Pastor Steve in his mind slap somebody, just say this. Well, at least people know how I feel. As if an excuse to just go off on somebody and be mean. Yeah, we know how you feel, and it's devilish. Well, at least people don't wonder what I feel about that. Well, we wish we did. You know, I mean, what is that? You know, no, I, I get it. We don't want people to be phony and fake. But if, you're, if your real is mean, spirit, nasty, and hurtful, I'll take a little phony. Throw a little phony at me. Someone once asked me one time, would you rather have people not like you and act like they did than like you and act like they didn't? And I think they were surprised when I said I'd rather them not like me and act like they did as long as they never find out that they don't like me. And you feel that way too. You know, I come out of my office whistling in here, and I come in here, and I think everybody adores me in this room. And as I look around, I'm convinced it's the truth. You, a, little, a little too enthusiastic there, but I appreciate it, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I don't go around one, oh, she didn't smile, he didn't smile, oh, he shook her hand, and I'm a, no, no. And then I get the email. 
which is a verbal, a written verbal, or then I get the, you know, and like, but it, until then, I'm the most lovable guy around. You should feel that way about me, I mean, you about you too. I don't know why I'm talking like Joel, but it just, I just went up five octaves. But you know what I'm saying? You should feel, I mean, just receive the love. Don't wonder until what? They speak. And then you can't ignore it anymore. Now, now it's not in my notes, but the Holy Spirit's saying, say this. I'm like, it's not in my notes. And I've only got nine minutes. It's not in my notes. There is biblical teaching that tells us that we need to be thick-skinned and tender-hearted and not the other way around. This is the flip side of what I'm saying now. I feel led by the Spirit. In other words, you can't, how about healing up some of those bruises and quit coming in here so bruised that if somebody doesn't smile at you, you get your feelings hurt? Okay? Maybe they didn't smile at you because they had some of that Mexican fiesta for breakfast. Not me. Sometimes, you know, what does the Bible declare? It's a, it's a glory to the Lord not to take offense. Oh, man, we need to put that on the wall of the church somewhere. It's the glory of, you glorify the Lord when you're not so easily offended. Some people live their whole life offended. That's a heavy burden to bear. Always offended, always wondering, why didn't she smile? Why didn't I get caught? No, no, no. We are, we're, Jesus provides abundant living. Come on. Yeah, but you don't know what I've been through, and I'm not one of the cool people. Look around the church. There's no cool people here. We're all, I mean, come on. Any all-state football players in the room? No? Huh? Maybe Pam? Oh, no, she was a just, I didn't know. <laughs> but she's a braggart. So what do you know? I was all-state in football. Really? No. In other words, we all come in here with swings and misses and bruises and, you know. But how about we lay, stand out there before you come in and say, Holy Spirit, bathe me with a shield so I won't be so easily offended. And you're going to be a happier person. Carrying an offense is a heavy burden, just you know. Always being offended by what somebody said or didn't say is a heavy burden. So that's not in the notes. That's the, that's the flip side of what we're saying. But that doesn't give me an excuse to go around saying mean things and say, wait a minute, Pastor Steve said I'm, you're not really? You're her, quit being so offended with that goofy hat on that silly shirt. See, I'm just playing around. Really, I'm talking to coach, not you. I mean, how can you wear that? See, you want to come in, and not, you got to come in and say, yeah, he's just cleaning around. I mean, people actually wear Chicago Cubs stuff in here. I mean, they're, but no shame at all. I mean, give me. I've even seen people show up here with Dallas Cowboys socks on. Yeah. Talk about getting in the back of the line to get into heaven. I mean, my word. <laughs> well, I want to thank the people from Dallas who are joining us today via Internet. <laughs> Please continue to send in those love offerings. God bless you. Thank you. You see, get this before we go eat, okay? We're going to eat, so we're going to have good. Get your strength to tame your tongue from the Holy Spirit, from the Lord. You try to do it yourself? Mm-mm. Trust me. You know, people say, permission to breath, sort of. Man, he's got a quick wit. Really? You don't want a quick wit. Quick wits can make other people laugh and get you in trouble. Don't, 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 don't ask for a quick wit. Because if you have a quick wit, you got to a lot of times say, Lord, put a governor, either you say it before or you say it afterwards, after apologizing. So don't sit up here and say, you know, oh, yeah, sometimes my quick wit is enjoyable to you as I step in it. But, you know, a lot of times, no. We want to say, Lord, I need to strike. I can't do this. And by the way, some of you aren't publicly funny, but you're shrewd in private conversations. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you could never stand up in front, but in private conversations, you can cut and dig and slash. Not here, but, you know, at the Baptist. At, not the Baptist, at the Presbyterian. No, not the Presbyterian. At that other church. Because nobody here does it. Oh, you could never stand up, and, but in private conversation, you could destroy a person. You could gossip about them. And someone says, well, it's, not, it's, it's true. Do you know true gossip is the worst gossip? If it's not true, it's called lying. Gossip, true gossip destroys. So yeah, you can't get up and do this, which by the way, don't ask for this if you can't do it. But boy, you can sure use your little private, you know, your little phone. 
I don't know why we use this for a phone anymore, but phone calls. Yeah, you can destroy. So everybody, whether you're a public speaker or a private speaker, you've got to put the governor on. God help me not to use my words to rip, destroy, cut, hammer. Yes. Oh, it's easy. You can point at somebody up front. But some of the people who judge the upfront people are the worst in private conversation. I know because it's been about me sometimes. Word gets back to me. I love you anyway. Not here, the people from the other church. So what are our lessons learned? Everybody sigh, say, ah, thank God we're at lessons learned. Oh, thank God. Man, this has been one. Thank you. Don't thank me. Thank James. I think James is kind of ticked off. Somebody said something bad about James, and he started writing this. You can't blame him. The Holy Spirit said, write this, Rex, because our words are powerful. Teachers should be chosen carefully, and you should choose that opportunity carefully. And once you get the opportunity, be diligent and prepare to diligently and live consistently. Don't get up here. I've, I've, I've confessed that I, that I asked God to help me with my word. I confess it. So I'm not saying, I never, I've learned never to say anything that hurts over now. So I'm going to say, do that, because I do it. This is through me to you. Help me. Now, can I promise you that I'm never going to, can I promise Caleb that I'm never going to tease him again? No. But I have had three things I wanted to say in the sermon, and I put them back and didn't use them. I'm doing better. <laughs> Even though he stole half my pizza Friday night. Number, letter B or C, teachers continue to learn and grow. If you have any position of authority, you have not arrived. I still read every article I can. I have a master's in leadership, and I read every article I can. If it says leadership in the title, I start reading, unless it's foolishness. But I mean, I'm drawn to it. I want to grow. I still read books. On, on, I, I've, been, I've been doing this now. Let's see, what am I, 50? I'm in my 50, whatever I mean, I don't know. But, uh, but for several years, and I still read the book. I still want to learn. I, you know, I mean, I haven't said, oh, I've got enough here now. Look at me, 50 years old. I mean, you know, right? We still learn. So you ought to be learning too. Wednesday night, 6.30. See you then. Yeah, be a magnet. I know the culture and the schedules pull stuff from us, but we've got so much other information being shoved in. We need to continue to want to learn. God help me to govern on my lips and God open my ears to truth. That should be our prayer. Remember, D, that our words define us. I'm sorry. But uh, yes, your attendance means something and your investments are good, but what you say let me know how, lets, lets me know how you're doing right now. Right now. And they define us. For the last couple of minutes, I want to use scripture here, and I want to tell you that Proverbs 10 says this, he who winks with the eye causes trouble, but a pro prating fool will fail, fall. The mouth of the righteous is a well of life. Well, there's a good side of the coin. Ah, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. In other words, you, it will cause strife. Proverbs 15, a soft answer turns away wrath. How many times have I seen that in my marriage, in our marriage, in all of our marriages, a soft answer turns away? We want to de-escalate, de-escalate with our words. But a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of a fool pours forth foolishness. Proverbs 20, plans are established by counsel, but wise counsel wages war. He who goes about as a talebearer, a talebearer is a gossip. Reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with one who flatters with his lips. How do, you, how do you tell the difference between someone who's flattering and someone who's edifying? I'll tell Sue this because she's paying attention. Sue, here's how you do this. If I'm saying nice things about you to bless you, then that's called encouragement and edification, and we should do that. If I'm doing it so that you'll think better about me, then that's called flattering. You see the difference? So it's about motive. Don't stop encouraging people or saying nice things about them. What are you saying it for? The Holy Spirit knows. God knows. So let's use our words to edify. Proverbs 25, a word fitly spoken, and this is the good part. And I, I, want, I said, God, give a scripture that doesn't just say, stop that. <laughs> but look at this. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver. That's what we need to talk about right there. E, abusive speech reveals violent character. My counseling with young people and, and growing up in my family, my dad got saved late. People would say there was physical abuse, but they said, well, well, what did he say? He didn't say anything. You know, you know that all physical abuse is emotional abuse. So they say, well, at least, was, you know. But, but the Bible also said, remember I said, those words echo long after that spanking heals up. Be careful what you say when you're in a position of authority. Be very careful. 
Boasting reveals an arrogant heart. Gossip shows a disrespect for others. Exaggeration, which is just lying. Exaggeration is lying. Let's just all agree with that. The fish you caught, Mike, wasn't this big. It was this big. Not that Mike exaggerates, but you fish still? You're still fishing? That's all he does. He's retired. He fish. Fishing is in his wife's honey-do list, so he doesn't get to fish much, but anyway. Yeah, this exaggeration. And I don't like the joke they're say, speaking evangelistically. That's not funny to me. To cast preachers and, and really uh, evangelists as liars. No, our, our word needs to be true. And most of the time when people exaggerate, it's because they got a poor soft self-image and because, you know, like, like in sports, guys are, and gals are tempted to do it because when my kids one home run and I hit five, but I only hit none, or I hit one, so I exaggerate so that I'll, so that, but I mean, people can easily believe that I hit more home runs than Mike, but not his sons. So, you know, so what I have to do, I've got to exaggerate. What do you exaggerate about? It matters. Because once people think you're an exaggerator, they don't believe you when you're telling the truth about the good stuff. Amen? Character, he's our character. My self-image comes through Jesus. I don't have to exaggerate. Now, when I'm leading the team in hitting, I might mention it in a sermon. That could happen, usually. So what am I saying in closing? Our conversation reveals our character. How's your character? I'll tell you how. How's your conversation? What are you talking about? What are you saying? And, and you, you can push people away from you, or you can draw people to you. Proverbs 18, 21, I close with this. The tongue has the power of life and death. Wow. The tongue has the power of life and death. Can I ask you to do me a favor then? Can we agree that the Bible says it's true? How many believe what the Bible says is true? So if the tongue has, let's stand with me with you. If the tongue has the power of life and death, then I'm going to ask you to do something for me. Mike, Mitch, Coach, Gabe, the tongue, you don't have to stand. The tongue has the power of life and death. We all agree with that. He's got a bad toe. How about we choose life? The tongue has a So I only have so many words. Like a man, what they say, man has 270 words, and women have 275,000 words each week. I don't know. I, I didn't, so I'm not. That's what they tell us. So let's use those words for life. If we know that, that words has life or death, let's use them for life. Sometimes that's life to say, I'm sorry, forgive me. Sometimes it's life to acknowledge them, you know. Sometimes it's life to, it, it's life to, to uh, recognize people for their ministry. Sometimes it's life just to, sometimes just call. You know, what, you know what Dobbin says? He says the most wonderful thing that people are, this is interesting to me, and I'm going to pray, and it's gonna, we're going to close a little different. We're going to sing, and then. He says our name is one of the most powerful things we can hear to make us feel good about ourselves. Now, obviously, you can't say it like this, you know. You can't say it like, uh, stupid Jamie. You know, there's your name. How does that make you feel? No. But to hear someone acknowledge you, hey, Jamie, something happens when people call. Think about that, our name. That they, that they oh, they know, like, you know, good to see you today. Or, enter, this, you know, we're, we're body, soul, mind, and spirit. And our mind is impacted, as we hear, but it, it leaches out into our spirit. It matters. What I say matters, and so do you. I'm choosing a life. How about you? I'm not going to be a stick in the mud. I'm not going to be robotic. I'm not going to be, but I'm going to be real discerning, and I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to really put that governor on my mouth. How about you? Would you do it today? Bow your heads and close your eyes. If you said to me, Pastor Steve, this message is for me. I'm committed. I want to... It's not that I'm not going to do bad. I'm going to use my, I'm going to be an encouraging, edifying, uplifting person. I'm not going to miss opportunities to speak life and hope and love. If that's you, put your hand up right now and put it down across this congregation. Come on. We can do it. You say, I haven't been known for that. Well, it's time to change. It's time to change. I want to be known for that. Heavenly Father, you see the hands across this congregation, God. Those that are saying, Lord, I'm going to be, I'm going to be your mouthpiece. I'm going to bless people. I'm going to be golden apples. I'm going to bring life to people who are hurting. I'm not going to shrink back. I'm not going to step off. I'm not going to turn away. When I see, I'm going to see, I'm going to look for lonely, hurting people to bring hope and life and truth. Hallelujah. People are going to, when I get around people, I'm going to seize the opportunity. Because as James warns us, 
we are going to be accountable for everything we say. And God, we're not perfect. No man can be perfect, but by the, with the Holy Spirit's help, we can bridle our tongues. We can control our words. We can do better with our speech. And we're going to give you all the praise and glory for it. Sign us up, Lord. Use us to speak your life and truth. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. All God's people say it. Amen. Amen. Can we sing one more song before we go as a prayer of dismissal? And those that are going to, who are ministry over the way, you can slip out. God bless you. God love you. I love you. Thanks for being here today. Stay if you can. We've got plenty of food. God bless you.